title of this sermon is Pledge Allegiance to Jesus and Leave the Rest Behind. And so as we begin our story today, we see that Jesus has been traveling and teaching in Judea. The Pharisees have been challenging him on whether it's lawful for a man to divorce his wife. And parents have been bringing their little children to Jesus so that he might lay his hands on them. And when the parents bring the children to Jesus, the disciples only notice one thing. They only notice that the people are crowding and pushing up against Jesus. And so the disciples rebuke the parents and tell them to stay away. But Jesus says, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. He says, truly I tell you that anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God as these little children can never enter it. I love watching my seven-year-old twin nephews and my six-year-old niece play. They're grandkids. They do so with such gusto, fully consumed by what they're doing. With them, there is no divided allegiance. It's as if the master of play says to them, play with everything you've got and don't hold back. Fully give your allegiance to me. Today, we'll consider how one rich young ruler does or doesn't demonstrate his allegiance to the master of life by how he handles money. You've heard the scripture read, and I'm not going to reread it, but you can get out your Bibles and you can read along for yourself, and hopefully you will go home later and meditate on the word of God. In Luke 18:18, 18, 18, we read a certain ruler asked, good teacher, What must I do to eternal, to inherit eternal life? But if you read the Mark version of this, and this story is in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. If you read the Mark 10 uh, version of this, it says in the 17th verse, it says, to give more vivid imagery, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before he asked them the question. This man didn't seek Jesus out at night like the Pharisee Nicodemus. He didn't hide and come in secret. He came in plain sight. There's something to be said, I think, for a rich ruler who would run amongst the people to see a carpenter and to fall at his feet. It must have uh, appeared a little indignant for somebody of his stature to do that. But he did it anyway. That sounds commendable. In Luke 18, 19, we read, why do you call me good? This is what what Jesus says to the man. Why do you call me good? Jesus says, no one is good except God alone. Now, of course, you and I know that Jesus is good. But he makes the distinction here, his goodness and ours take a back seat to the goodness of God. Jesus already knows that this man probably sees himself better than what he really is. If you and I are honest, and I like honesty, I like authenticity. I don't like people to be shucking and jiving with me. I like people to be truthful. I don't like you to sugarcoat stuff for me. Just tell me what you need. Tell me what you want. Tell me where I'm wrong so I can make correction. But I digress. Jesus knows the man sees himself probably better than he really is. And if you and I are honest, we see ourselves better than we really are too. Think about it. How often have you had thoughts like that of the Pharisee praying in the temple with the tax collector. If you go up a little higher in Luke 18 at verse 
verses 10 and 11, you'll see it says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So folks, let's not kid ourselves. We've had thoughts like that. We've seen people on the street. And sometimes, I, I, let me just talk about myself because I can't get into your head. But I've been on the streets, seeing people on the streets. And I would some, or, or, or going to New York City. This is a good one. You come through the tunnel and somebody is there with a shh, shh, shh to wash your windshields. And you want to say, why don't they get a real job? We're judgmental. Just like this rich young, young man probably was. We all have thought more highly of ourselves than we should have at one time or another. So on the surface, today's parable is about a rich young ruler's allegiance to wealth, but there's much more to this story. Allegiance means loyalty. It means devotion. It means faithfulness to a person, place, or thing. And our allegiance can be measured by whether we do the things the way we are instructed by that person, place, or thing, or we do things the way we want to. When we don't do the things the way the subject of our allegiance tells us to, we're not really giving them our allegiance. But our allegiance is going somewhere else. Y'all with me on that? Or do I have to say that again? If you got it, raise your hand. All right, I think most of you got it. And our allegiance doesn't have to be to money. Now, money is a good topic to talk about to show illustration. But when Jesus meets this young man and they talk about money, our understanding is that the things that draw him away from Jesus don't have to be just money. The things that draw us away don't have to be money. We have allegiances to all kinds of things. I think the point is that if we're not giving the sovereign of our life, our allegiance, by doing what he says, we're missing the mark. And so when Jesus meets this man that day, he offers him two options. Do things the way that I say to demonstrate your allegiance to me, or do things your way, showing your allegiance to something else. Do things the way Jesus says, or do things your way. You know, I think that God can use all kinds of things to help us understand biblical concepts. Now, I know, you know, Romans 8.28 says, God works in all things. I believe that. I've seen it in my life. And so I'm going to say some things here. Now, those of you who have been so holy, holy all your life, saved all your life, had it all together all your life, y'all might want to just block your ears up for a minute. And when we're done, I'll wave my hand and let you know you can unblock your ears, okay? I haven't been saved all my life, even though I've been in church all my life. You hear what I said? Anyway, many years ago, there was a singer named Johnny Ace. Anybody know Johnny Ace? Remember that name? This was more than, I see you, more than 60 years ago. I know it because my mom loved to listen to Johnny Ace. And Johnny Ace, he had a, a hit song, and it was called Pledging My Love. And in that song, Johnny Ace, uh, the, 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 the man in the song, um, wanted to be assured of a woman's love for him, her allegiance to him. The man didn't want the allegiance to be divided, but he wanted total allegiance to him. So now maybe y'all 
not too many hands went up when I said Johnny Ace, so maybe y'all don't know who Johnny Ace was. That's okay. It was more than 60 years ago. But how about if I said LL Cool J? Anybody know him? All right. So LL Cool J, he had a song called Lounging. But the hook to the song was, who do you love? Are you for sure? Y'all remember that? Uh, let me see. Who remembers that? I got, I got to see what I'm working with. Okay. And so this song is about a player who has a lady that he lavishes with material goods, perfumes and dresses and gold, and he even helps her get her due done. But the man neglects to spend quality time with her in the ways that really matter to her. In other words, he wants to show his allegiance one way, and she wants to see it a different way. And so the song keeps asking two questions. Who do you love? Are you for sure? Jesus is really asking, I think, this rich young ruler, where do your allegiances lie? And are you for sure? These are important questions. They weren't just important for the rich young ruler. They're important for us. Because misdirected allegiances draw us away from Jesus. And Jesus has a better plan. Who do you love? Who's your allegiance to? And are you sure? I think this rich young ruler rationalized that he was demonstrating his allegiance to God based on the fact that he kept the commandments. He had done that since he was a child. At first glance, this is commendable. We should keep the commandments. But in the end, this rich young ruler did not do the thing that Jesus asked him to do. He kept the commandments, but Jesus asked him to do something else. What is Jesus asking us to do? But we are doing something else. Jesus doesn't ask every rich person to give up their wealth, but he does ask every one of us to give up something sacrificially. And he names the thing in order for us to demonstrate our allegiance to him. Just wave if you're still with me. Okay. In Luke 18, 20, and 22, Jesus said, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And the boy says to him, the young man says to him, I have kept all of these since I was a boy. When Jesus heard him say this, Jesus said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Verse 23 says, when he heard this, the young man became very sad because he was very wealthy. This rich young man was conflicted. Where did his allegiance lie? His wealth was giving him a sense of security and well-being. Wealth was something that was tangible for him. He could see it. He could touch it and feel it. It was something he felt he could control. It was something that had worked for him in the past. We have things in our lives like that. We see them. We feel them. We touch them. We have experience with them that shows us they've worked for us in the past, so we keep on doing what we do despite what God is saying to us. What this rich young ruler failed to understand and realize was that, was that Jesus doesn't necessarily offer something tangible that can be seen. But Jesus tells us, have hope in the unseen. Jesus doesn't necessarily offer something that we can control, nor do we have to because Jesus is in control of everything. 
Jesus doesn't just offer us something that has worked in our past, but he offers us what will work in our future and forever because Jesus never fails. He's always faithful. He's always just. He's always trustworthy. He's always got us. He always keeps us. No matter our stuff, he doesn't leave us. He always pursues us. He always comes running after us despite our stuff. And we got lots of stuff. When the opportunity was offered to this young man to show his allegiance to Jesus by doing the thing that Jesus asked him to do, the young man walked away. Jesus asks us every day to do something to show our allegiance to him, to make a decision, to give something up, to repent of something. And he's not the one that walks away from us. We walk away. Where do your allegiances lie this morning? Are you for sure? What is that thing that Jesus has asked you to do to show him your allegiance that you are not doing? What is it? What is that thing you're thinking about right now that has taken residency in your life as a substitute for your full allegiance to Jesus? What is the thing you're unwilling to let go of? What is the thing you're afraid to let go of? What is that thing that you feel you have to hold on to so tightly? What is the thing that Jesus has asked you to do or give up or sacrifice that you're not doing because you think he's asked for too much? And by the way, this thing sits on the throne of your life. But remember, your life was bought with a price, the shed blood of Jesus. First Corinthians 7.23 says, God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. And yet, we find ourselves chasing after things that bind us, and shackle us, and we cannot show up the way the Lord wants us to. The man's wealth was like that. In Luke 18, 24 and 25, Jesus says, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we don't know whether Jesus was talking about a tiny gate through which it was nearly impossible for camels to pass. We don't know if he was talking about a sewing needle. But that doesn't matter, and those aren't the points. In verses 26 through 28, the disciples who were around and who heard Jesus talking to the man and telling him how hard it was for the rich to be saved, the disciples asked then, who can be saved? It was thought that if you had riches on earth, then surely you would be blessed in heaven too because of your riches. It was a sign of entry into the kingdom. But that wasn't, the, wasn't true. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It is not our money. It is not our status. It is not the things that we possess. It is not our education. It is not our pedigree. I've said this many, many times. It's part of the mantra running through my head. It's only through Christ. And Jesus calls on us to trust him. 
But we say, well, I would do it if only I could see you operating more quickly. Jesus, I trust you if only I knew what you were up to. Jesus, I trust you if only it didn't make me feel so less in charge. If only it didn't make me feel so less dependent or so, so dependent. Jesus, I'd do it if only it didn't make me have to sacrifice that thing. I'll sacrifice this. I'll give you that. You could even have that over there. But this thing, mm, mm -mm. this thing I can't let go of. What is the thing that's sitting on the throne of your life that you can't let go of? What are you thinking of right now? What are you saying to yourself? First Timothy 6.17 reads, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything for us to enjoy. In Luke 18, 28, Peter says, we have left everything to follow you. <laughs> everything. And Jesus says in verse 29, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. We can't give God enough. That song, you can't beat God's giving, you can't. It's not just that you can't beat him with giving money. You just can't beat him with anything you give. Amen. Amen. And what you give has eternal redemption. It has eternal value. I read in my Bible something about crowns that will be distributed. We can't beat God's giving. You know, like I said, I like authenticity. I like honesty. We can be honest because we can trust God with our hearts. I don't have to trust you with my heart. I trust God with my heart. And so when God says, say it, I say it. And it lands as it lands. But he gives me wisdom through the power of his Holy Spirit. So I will share lots of personal things with you. Because I think God can use those personal stories to bless somebody. Amen. And if I share my personal story with you, you might share your personal story with somebody else. If I share my personal story with you and you see that it doesn't kill me, <laughs> maybe then you'll say, well, you know, maybe it'll be all right. Maybe I can share my own personal story. And so I'm going to share a personal story. But let, but let me tell you, it is not a private story. Because my private stories are only for the ones that I'm intimate with and Jesus. All right. So nearly 39 years ago, I was involved in a dating relationship that I believe was not pleasing to God. The person cared for me more than I cared for him, and I knew that. But I used him for my own purposes with my church going self. <laughs> you get where I'm coming from. When my grandmother asked me, is he the one? Immediately, I knew he was not. And I knew that the relationship had to stop. So I broke off things with him the next day. That night, when I made that decision, I prayed that God would bring me the man that was his choice for me. Somebody who would accept me just as I was and somebody that I would accept as he was and not try to change. 
I dove into God's word with great intentionality and fully gave my allegiance to him. In the beginning, I was terribly lonely. I'm not going to lie to you. There were many times I wanted to pick up the phone and make a phone call, but I didn't because God helped me. Every day, my allegiance and reliance on God grew stronger, and so did I. And one day when I least expected it, I was just minding my business at work, doing my work. In my, and in my gregarious way, I said hello to somebody who had come to apply for a job. <laughs> oh, Lord. Before I knew it, I had met the man who would become my husband. Amen. And now, 34 years later, I thank God Hallelujah. for supplying all my needs, for giving me everything I wanted, Amen. for giving me more than I could have ever imagined, for making it sweeter than I could have ever imagined. I thank God for my husband's and my collective and individual efforts to give allegiance to him. God has kept us through a pandemic, through the death of family, through the death of friends, through disappointments, through broken relationships, and through so, so much more. Our allegiance to him remains solid, not because of our goodness, but because God is good. We have never given up anything for the cause of the kingdom for which we have not been richly rewarded over and over and over again. We are far from perfect, but every day we are seeking to know how God, how we can be more genuine in our allegiance to God. So I've told you what has to happen with allegiances, with doing the things that we need to do for God. So how then do we learn to give our allegiance to God? How do we learn it? First, read his word. But don't read his word like you read any book. The Bible is different. It is God's instruction manual for living. It is not just historical, poetic, inspirational, and prophetic. But it is the very voice of God, your creator. When you read it, don't do it as a sideline observer. Rather, absorb the word of God as an active participant. Dig into it. Search his word for what God is saying to you personally. Now, some people's strategy for reading the Bible, if they still have a, a paper Bible and it's not on their phone, is to take it and just drop it on the table. And wherever it opens up to, that's where they read. Probably going to land you somewhere in Psalms. Well, I guess that's a strategy, right? And any strategy, I guess, is better than no strategy at all. But there are better ways to dig into the Word of God. There's Bible study. There's online resources. There's con um, concordances. You can do a search of something that you're interested in, that topic, and look it up. Tons of scriptures will come up. Make a plan. The other thing you need to do or you can do to learn how to give your allegiance to, to God is to center your mind 
on Jesus. Center your mind on Jesus. There are so many things that grab for our attention. But everybody under the sound of my voice knows how to make time and find a place to be alone with the one they want to be with. I'm going to say it again. Everybody under my voice knows how to make time and find a place to be alone with the one they want to be with. Show you right. <laughs> find that place and close the door to everything and everybody else. Do it even if you have to hang a sign on the door that says, do not disturb. Spending time with Jesus. If you make a date with Jesus, he won't stand you up. He'll show up. And then seek to know Jesus with the gusto and the inquisitiveness and the urgency of a child. Don't seek him as one who has all the time in the world because you don't know when your time will run out. But seek Jesus as one desperately searching for the source of everlasting joy and comfort in the midst of sorrow and healing for brokenness and assurance in the midst of doubt and uncertainty and peace that passes all understanding. Seek him with your whole heart. The word says when you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. Seek him. And so just a couple more things. My friends, as you leave this place today, remember that our allegiance to God is demonstrated by doing what he says. Whenever we give our allegiance to money or people or anything but God, we'll always be out of line with God. And we will never be secure because at any moment, the money can dry up. The job can go away. People can walk out of our lives. These are all temporal things. They will pass away. But Jesus is eternal. And so is his kingdom. <laughs> Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Doing things our way instead of God's way does not necessarily show allegiance to him. It doesn't show allegiance to him. You can't have partial allegiance. You got to have full allegiance. His way is better. And his storehouses of blessings will never run out. You can trust him. You can trust him. You can trust him. And finally, Psalm 37, 25 says, I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor their children begging bread. And Philippians 4, 19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Who are you giving your allegiance to? Are you sure? Amen.